Um, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Um, to people here in Sala Europa in Villa Schifanoia at the European University Institute and to our guests who are online have joined the Zoom webinar. My name is Benno Gamal. I'm the professor for the history of gender and sexuality um, here at the European University Institute in the Department for the History of for History and Civilization. And um, in that capacity, I co-organize um, the um, Ursula Hirschman lecture together with the Robert Schumann Center and Eric Jones. Um, and I will just briefly kind of give you an idea of what will happen in the next hour or so. Um, so we will have an opening remark by Eric Jones and then um, the president of the European University Institute um, will extend his welcome remarks to us all. And after that, um, Sarah Nguyen will introduce our distinguished speaker, Lady Hale. Um, so very welcome, very warm welcome to Lady Hale as well, which whom we cannot see but um, can listen to. Lady Hale will then present her thoughts on regulating human reproduction. Um, and after that, we will have two respondents, two um, PhD researchers from the European University Institute. And then in the end, the audience here in Sala Europa, but also guests online can ask questions. Um, if you want to do so, I say that um, in the very beginning, you can use the Q&A function of your Zoom webinar um, screen on the bottom of it. There should be a Q&A fu function and there you can post questions and comments, um, and then I will, um, during the Q&A, read those out and share them with Lady Hale, who will then also respond to these questions. So that is, in a nutshell, what we all now look very much forward to. Um, and now, without any further ado, I hand over to Professor Eric Jones, the director of the Robert Schumann Center here at the European University Institute. Floor is yours, Eric. No, thank you so much, Benno, and thank you all for coming here. Thank you in particular, Lady Hale. It's an exquisite pleasure to have you speak to us this evening uh, in the, the event and the topic could not be more important. Uh, the Ursula Hirschman Lecture is an event that we hold every year to honor Ursula Hirschman, who was an incredible figure in the history of European integration. She was an early economist in, in the 1930s. She was an anti-fascist and worked hard to undermine the fascist regime here in Italy. She was a devout European federalist, uh, and importantly, she was a feminist who rallied women uh, to the cause of Europe. And we use her memory as an opportunity to celebrate all of these things, things that are essential to the identity of the European University Institute, uh, related to social science, uh, related to democracy and liberty, uh, related to the construction of Europe, and most important, uh, related to the functioning uh, of a well-ordered society. And that well-ordered society has never been more at risk than it is today. Uh, you can hear from my accent that I come from the United States. Uh, in the United States right now and in the state of Texas where I grew up, they have brought back into controversy uh, the regulation of reproductive rights in ways that are, uh, quite frankly, astonishing. Uh, undermining the rule of law by introducing legal tricks uh, that allow them to escape judicial supervision uh, and opening the door to a whole conversation uh, about reproductive rights that we thought we had put to bed uh, many years ago. We must reconsider these issues. Uh, we must consider them carefully because our well-ordered society uh, runs the risk of being in an opposite, uh, going in the opposite direction. So with that in mind, uh, I can only invite Benno to come back and push these proceedings forward uh, because, Lady Hale, I'm very eager uh, to hear what you have to say. So thank you very much for coming. Thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, and now it's my great pleasure to invite um, Professor Renaud Hus, the president of the European University Institute, to share his words of welcome with us. Thank you, Benno. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, good morning, or good evening, rather, everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to join you even from a, a short distance. Uh, this is an important event, uh, addressing uh, an important and topical issue, as we just heard from Eric. And um, it, it's also uh, a way for us to commemorate uh, a leading figure in uh, the early years of the European movement, but also to uh, insist on, uh, uh, well, a set of issues uh, that are very important uh, for an institution such as the EUI. 
Gender issues are, of course, an important research topic, but they're more than that. They're an important issue for a community uh, such as the Institute uh, and uh, for uh, an institution which has at regular intervals to, uh, let's say, revisit its uh, modus operandi. In that uh, context, for instance, it was recently emphasized that uh, actually we have rather few uh, chairs and, and lectures named after leading uh, female role models. And uh, I'm pleased to say that the Ursula Hirschman uh, lecture is, uh, well, uh, uh, an excellent counterexample and, and an example of uh, what we need to develop further, which we will do. It's um, also a great pleasure, of course, uh, for me to, to be able to welcome uh, a distinguished speaker such as Lady Hale tonight. Uh, it's uh, a formidable opportunity to hear her views on uh, 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 topics uh, that are, are really of central importance today. And, if you allow me, I would also um, say that uh, the difficulties, the connection difficulties we are experiencing tonight are in some respect a metaphor of uh, the broader difficulties we, we have at times in staying connected to the UK. Uh, but I'm, I'm very happy that notwithstanding adverse winds, uh, we have managed to preserve not only tonight's connection, but the, the British connection in uh, more general terms. And I very much hope that we will be in a position to welcome uh, Lady Hale in presence in a not too distant future. Um, but I will now uh, simply wish everyone a very uh, stimulating session and hand over uh, to uh, Sarah Nowen, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you and have a nice evening. Thank you very much, Renaud. And as you already said, I now hand over to Sarah Nguyen um, from the Law Department, um, who will introduce Lady Hale. Thank you very much. When introducing Baroness Hill of Richmond, it is tempting to comply with the rules of human reproduction. During Baroness Hill's lecture, we will probably immediately find out that my usage of the term human reproduction here deviates from the common understanding. I use it here to refer to how we reproduce human lives through narratives about those lives. Introductions are a genre governed by its own rules, mostly unwritten, in which we reproduce the life of the one we introduce. It is a very selective reproduction, a reproduction of what the introducer considers highly relevant of that life. Now, Baroness Hill must have been a subject to such introductions for over a thousand times, if not more. The result of the application of the rules of reproduction of her life is a remarkable story. It is one of many firsts, and unfortunately, also one of many onlys, or fews. First of the class in all subjects in secondary school, only one of six women in her year to study law at Cambridge, graduating top of her class with a start first. And for those of you who do not know Cambridge, obtaining a start first is almost impossible. The first woman and youngest person in the UK to be appointed to the Law Commission, the first High Court judge in England and Wales to have made a career as an academic and public servant rather than as a barrister, only the second woman to be appointed to the Court of Appeal of England and Wales, and the first and only woman to have had the office of Lord of Appeal in Ordinary in the British House of Lords. She was the first woman to become the UK Supreme Court's Deputy President and later President. We tell the life of first and onlys because they tell us something about the person in front of us. The desire for justice that must have driven them the battles they must have fought, and the determination that was required on their part. We also tell it out of gratitude. Life in their slipstream is better, easier, and more just. 
But when the story is told only in terms of firsts and onlys, we do not do, do justice to the individual in front of us. For instance, when Kamala Harris was recently elected as vice president of the US and was constantly introduced as the first female vice president and the highest ranking female official in the US history, as well as the first African-American, the first Asian-American vice president, I got frustrated that the standard introductions said more about the society that had elected her than herself. Who was she? What did she stand for? With Baroness Hill, thankfully, it is not difficult to identify what she stands for. Throughout her legal career, and no matter in what function, academic, law commissioner, judge, she has stood for the rights of marginalized groups in society. Children, women, the disabled, those without food on the table. As the Supreme Court's judgment in the Brexit case, Miller versus the Prime Minister illustrates, she also stands for speaking law to power. As the president of the Supreme Court, she delivered a unanimous judgment. And that bears emphasizing this because the fact that it was a unanimous judgment and she was the president probably is testament for her capacity to promote a sense of community and harmony within a group, a group of very strong-willed individual lawyers. And the verdict read, the prime minister's advice to her majesty was unlawful, void and of no effect. The provocation was also void and of no effect. Parliament has not been prorogued. Characteristically, she did so wearing a brooch of an insect. As it happened she, to be, she later explained, a spider. To the world, this left the indelible impression of spider woman reigning in British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. In concluding and rebelling against the unwritten rules of introductions, I want to take you to a place that is not often spoken about in public lectures, the toilet. It is a place worthy of study because if it took place, because how much deal making will have excluded women if the deal making to took place on the toilet. The toilet I want to take you is the one in the Barbican in London. In October 2019, only two weeks after Baroness Hill delivered the famous judgment in the Miller case, a major conference on international law was about to start with opening words of Baroness Hill. A whole line of women was in front of the sinks and the mirrors, washing their hands, adjusting their hair, adjust, reapplying their makeup. There's nothing striking about this. But if one looked a bit lower, there was one, if I dare say, entirely new phenomenon. All these women, and they must have been at least a dozen, you know, these theater toilets with well, an industry of toilets, or, ranging from their mid 20s to the mid 70s, were wearing a brooch. This was their way of saying, we are keen to follow in the footsteps of Baroness Hill, not only because she was a pathbreaker, also for us, but especially because of what she stands for. Baroness Hill, thank you so much for being with us today at the EOI. Thank you so much for that far too generous uh, introduction. I'm very sorry that you can't see me, uh, but I hope that you will not get too bored by what I have to say. It's a great honor to be invited to deliver this lecture in memory of Ursula Hirschman. She was an early pioneer of European integration. She is listed by the European Commission as one of the founding fathers of the EU. Surely this must be some mistake and she should have been listed as one of the founding mothers. She was a great feminist and any feminist must be interested in the subject of regulating human reproduction because this has almost always meant regulating women's reproduction. Much of what we regulate these days, however, was scarcely heard of while Ursula Hirschman was alive. Any talk about regulation must ask, what are we regulating and why are we regulating it? This is particularly pertinent when it comes to human reproduction because a strong case 
can be made for not regulating it at all. A case might also be made for requiring everyone who wants to have a child to get a license to do so. But the practical and principled objections to that come tumbling to mind. The reality lies somewhere between these two extremes. We have always tried to regulate human reproduction, but in different ways and for different reasons. I can only speak from my own experience as an English family lawyer, regulator and judge. Limited and parochial, of course, but it has still given me plenty of food for thought. Throughout history, the law has tried to regulate reproduction by regulating women and not by regulating men. Their biological asymmetry may be one reason for this, but it is probably not the only reason. Thus, the only legally and socially acceptable context within which a woman could have children was marriage. Having children outside marriage was strongly discouraged and at times even punished. Both mother and child were stigmatized and denied the legal and social support that they would have had within marriage. But within marriage, it was not only acceptable for a woman to have children, it was her legal duty to do so. She had an obligation to have sexual intercourse with her husband whenever he wanted it. A husband could not be guilty of raping his wife in English law until 1991. A husband's excessive sexual demands might amount to cruelty, but so might a wife's indifference to having sex and even more to having children. Failure to produce the children whom the husband wanted was the earliest reason for bringing a marriage to an end. Think of Henry VIII and his six wives, divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. In fact, the marriages which did not end in death were annulled rather than dissolved, but the substance was the same. And when divorce was eventually introduced, the most common ground for two centuries was the wife's adultery. Male adultery was not without more regarded as a good reason for divorce until 1923. This was because in English law, there was a very strong presumption that any child born to a married woman was her husband's child. Her children belonged to her husband in more ways than one. Not only was he presumed to be their genetic father, whether or not this was the case, but he was also the sole possessor of rights and authority over them, at least until he died or a court order gave some rights to the wife. Wives did not get automatic equal rights and authority over their children in English law until 1972. These rules could, of course, be presented as being for the benefit of women who enjoyed the comfort and support of their husbands. We called it coverture in English law, but in fact, they were for the benefit of men. Among the aristocracy and property classes, they facilitated their dynastic ambitions. A man could choose a suitable mate with whom to make an alliance and to have children who would inherit his property and his status. He could, of course, have as many children as he liked outside marriage, but marriage enabled him to limit the children whom he would recognize and take responsibility for. And until the 20th century, the reality was that most married women had a baby every year until they reached the menopause, if they survived that long. Many of these children died, but it kept many wives tied to the home and household duties, thus further entrenching the gender roles enforced through the property regime. Advances in medicine and hygiene during the 19th century meant that more of the children survived and there was something of a population explosion. Then in the 20th century, along came contraception. Not everyone approved of women having the ability to regulate their own reproduction. As late as 1934, the Bishop of London is reported to have told the House of Lords that, quote, when I hear of 400,000 contraceptives being manufactured every week, I would like to make a bonfire of them and dance around it, end of quote. But the first wave of feminism and the availability of contraception to females brought profound changes. 
At first, access to female contraception was limited to married women. But in the early 1970s, it was made free for everyone on the National Health Service. In 1967, abortion became lawful in certain circumstances, but these were quite broadly defined. The gatekeepers both to abortion and to contraception were the medical profession. But women now had much greater control of their own fertility and their lives were transformed. No longer did they have to choose between marriage and a career. They could aspire to have both. No longer did most households correspond to the traditional stereotype of male breadwinner and female homemaker. By the second half of the 20th century, marriage itself had changed its character. It was no longer so obviously designed to serve the interests of the husband. It was a more egalitarian arrangement whose principal function was to provide support and protection for the children and the less advantaged spouse should things go wrong. But as marriage became more egalitarian, it began to lose its appeal. Bit by bit, it became more and more acceptable to live together without being married and even to have children without being married. The adverse consequences for the children of being born outside marriage were done away with in the 1970s. By the end of the 1980s, it could certainly be said that marriage was no longer the way of regulating human reproduction. But did anything take its place? For couples who wanted and could have children in the usual way, the answer is no. They were no longer constrained to have children in marriage. They were no longer constrained to stay together. Births outside marriage and lone parenting soared. But there were more and more people who wanted to have children but could not or would not have them in the usual way. There were the couples, either or both of whom were infertile or unable to carry and bear a child. There were the single people who wanted to have children, but not a partner. And there were the same sex couples, both male and female, who also wanted to have children, but not in the usual way. The medical profession had long been helping couples out with donor sperm, but in an entirely ad hoc and unregulated way. The law assisted. In 1987, it was provided that if a married woman was inseminated with donor sperm, her husband would automatically become the child's legal father for almost all purposes, unless it was shown that he had not consented. But science was rapidly expanding the possibilities. Louise Brown, the world's first test tube baby, was born in 1978. The clamor for regulation began. An expert committee was convened under the leadership of Dame Mary Warnock, a philosopher and educationalist. Their 1984 report led to the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act 1990 and the setting up of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, a pioneer in the regulation of assisted reproduction. Its principal task was to license clinics to provide these services to give binding guidance to the clinics, providing them, to regulate the use and storage of human gametes, and to keep a register through which the genetic link between gamete donors and child could be traced. I had the privilege of being a founder member of the authority and chaired the committee which drafted its code of practice. This raised a whole host of questions. Some were comparatively easy. Obviously, clinics had to have the right facilities and staff to provide a safe and efficient service. Sperm had to be quarantined for six months between donation and treatment to protect against HIV and other infections. But other questions were more difficult. How many children should a single donor be permitted to father? How many embryos should be replaced in the mother? Should there be an age limit on offering treatment? But 
But there were even trickier questions. It is a condition of any license that a woman must not be provided with treatment unless, quote, account has been taken of the welfare of any resulting child, including, in its original form, the need of the child for a father, end quote. The original object was fairly clear, to discourage, but not to outlaw, providing treatment to single or lesbian mothers. But it applied to all women. This was very controversial. Was the appropriate analogy with adoption, where the prospective adopters are very thoroughly assessed for their suitability and match with the child? Or was it with having children in the usual way? where there are no such checks upon the potential parent's suitability. Some doctors and parents rejected the adoption analogy because the mother would carry the baby in the usual way. And there was some push to make the whole process as much like an ordinary birth as possible. Others thought that extraordinary steps were being taken to create a child who would not otherwise have been born so that some protection for that child was warranted. But how was a clinic to go about deciding whether the proposed parents would be good enough parents anyway? We recommended some fairly rudimentary checks in the hope that children would not be born to known child abusers. But of course, genetic testing to avoid inherited diseases was less controversial. The most dramatic change since then has been in the attitude to same-sex couples. This went hand in hand with, the de with developments in the parentage rules. The 1987 rule that the mother's husband was automatically the child's legal father had introduced a difference in treatment between the children of married and unmarried parents at the very time that the law had determined to abolish such differences. So under the 1990 Act, the rule was extended to the mother's unmarried male partner, another sign that marriage had lost its role in policing reproduction. Then in 2002, the law permitted unmarried couples to adopt jointly. This included same-sex couples who at that time couldn't marry. But soon afterwards, in 2004, same-sex couples were permitted to enter into civil partnerships with almost all the legal consequences of marriage. The parentage rules had to be expanded to accommodate lesbian couples. In 2008, it was provided that, as long as they both consented in writing, at the time of the procedure which led to the birth, the mother's female partner would become the other mother of the child for almost all legal purposes. At the same time, the clinic's duty to have regard to a child's need for a father was replaced by a duty to have regard to the child's need for, quote, supportive parenting, end quote. There are other controversial conditions in clinics licenses. For example, that the mother and any partner be offered suitable counseling, not something which other intending parents are required to have. More importantly, the clinic has to keep records from which the link between the child and the genetic parents can be identified. This raises what is probably the most contentious issue of all. We now recognize that children have the right to know their genetic identity. Since the 1970s, we have allowed adopted children to trace their birth parents. In practice, often only their birth mothers can be traced, but sometimes both. But the whole point of medicalized sperm donation was that it was anonymous. The donor is not the legal father and has no legal responsibilities towards the child. Was it right to break that guarantee of anonymity by allowing the children to trace the father? When the 1990 Act was passed, 
the law was quite clear that the link could only be traced for the specific purpose of preventing incestuous unions. We had a vote in the authority on whether the law should eventually be changed. Those of us who supported the rights of the child won by a very narrow margin. Once again, however, the law was changed prospectively in 2008. This highlights another issue with regulation. The more you try to regulate things, the more people will try to find their way around it. Treatment in a licensed clinic is usually expensive and involves considerable intrusion into the private life of anyone receiving treatment. In the case of sperm donation, regulation is easy to avoid. Sperm can be bought from sperm banks abroad. Blue-eyed Danish sperm is particularly popular. Or sperm can be acquired from known donors, as many lesbian couples do. This is not always a good idea. Obviously, it's not so safe. And the law reports contain plenty of cases where the mothers expected the donor to play little or no part in the child's life, but the donor had other ideas and the courts are usually sympathetic to him. And the advantage of becoming the child's other mother only applies to treatment in a licensed clinic. Changed attitudes to same-sex couples have been accompanied by changed attitudes to surrogacy. The majority of the Warnock Committee in 1984 were strongly against it, even in compelling medical circumstances because of the danger of exploitation. People should not treat other people as a means to an end. A minority disagreed. This was not as clear cut a moral issue as the other members of the committee suggested. In the event, the Surrogacy Arrangements Act 1985 compromised. Professionals were not banned from taking part as the majority had recommended but the commercial activities of surrogacy agencies, whether the agency was profit-making or philanthropic, and advertisements were banned. The surrogate mother was the child's legal mother. If married, her husband, or later also her partner, would be the child's legal father. And the arrangement was always unenforceable. Amendments in 2008 softened towards the activities of non-profit making bodies, but the arrangements which those bodies promote are altruistic and non-commercial. However, there is nothing to prevent would-be parents resorting to commercial agencies making commercial arrangements abroad. And under the 1990 Act, a procedure was introduced for transferring parentage from the surrogate mother to the commissioning parents or now parent, whether the arrangements were made in the UK or abroad. Nothing illustrates the changing attitudes towards surrogacy better than the last case that I heard as president of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. A woman had become incapable of bearing children as a result of medical negligence. She had eight of her own eggs frozen in storage. She wanted compensation, amongst other things, for the cost of surrogacy arrangements. Her goal was to have the four children she had always wanted. She wanted to try for two with her own eggs, fertilized by her partner, and another two using donor eggs, also fertilized by her partner. And in both cases, she wanted to use commercial arrangements in California rather than altruistic arrangements in the UK. The hospital resisted all of this with some support from an earlier decision of mine while I was in the Court of Appeal. The case raised three questions. Were damages to fund surrogacy using the claimant's own eggs recoverable? If damages to fund surrogacy were in principle recoverable, did this extend to funding surrogacy using donor eggs? 
and in either event, were damages recoverable to fund foreign commercial surrogacy arrangements? The Supreme Court, by a majority, answered all three questions yes. The first was unproblematic. Surrogacy using her own eggs, fertilized by her partner, would give her what she had lost by not being able to bear the child herself. The earlier case had held that the second would not be a true replacement of what she had lost because these would not be her own genetic children. But changes in our notions of parenthood had broken the formerly inevitable link between genetic and legal or social parenthood. So we held that that was okay. The third was the most problematic. But for the majority, changes in the attitudes to surrogacy, including the court's willingness to grant parental orders as a result, meant that damages to fund commercial surrogacy were no longer contrary to public policy. However, of course, it had to be reasonable to resort to such arrangements, so the safety and safeguards attached to the foreign arrangements would be important. And there must be no exploitation of the surrogates and no risk of buying or selling children. And the cost had also to be reasonable. The figures we were given were eye-watering and seemed mainly to involve legal fees rather than medical expenses and compensation for the surrogate. The minority of the court agreed on the first two issues, but not on the cost of foreign commercial surrogacy. Our thinking was much influenced by a consultation paper issued by the official law reform bodies of England and Wales and Scotland, the Law Commissions, which not only contained a wealth of useful information, discussion about the possible harmful effects of surrogacy on the participants and the children, and ethical argument, but also proposed a new pathway which would pave the way not only for properly safeguarded commercial arrangements, both here and abroad, but also for an automatic transfer of parenthood if the right procedures were followed. Among the interesting facts to emerge was that surrogacy arrangements in the UK are almost always full surrogacy, using eggs which are not those of the surrogate mother. In heterosexual cases, either the commissioning parents, egg or sperm, or both will be used. But as many as half the surrogacy arrangements made by agencies in the UK are for same-sex male partners, using the sperm of one of them and donor eggs. My sense is that there is considerable pressure from male same-sex couples for a change in the law, which makes surrogacy arrangements unenforceable. But we're still awaiting the final recommendations of the law commissions. I suppose that restricting surrogacy arrangements is the first time that the law has placed limits on the ability of men to reproduce when and with whom they want. All the law's previous attempts at regulation have been aimed at restricting women's freedom of choice. But I do wonder what it is all for. Is it to protect the women, the men, the children, or society, or all of them? Now that we have abandoned almost all attempts to regulate reproduction using the usual methods, are we justified in attempting to regulate reproduction using the so-called artificial methods, especially when regulation is comparatively easy to avoid. There's a strong case for insisting on proper safety standards, both in the gametes used and in the treatment facilities using them. But is there a case for going further and making it easier for some people to access these facilities than others? And is it right that our parentage rules favour unmarried people who are treated in licensed clinics in the UK, while the mother's husband rule applies wherever the treatment took place. 
These are complex questions, which I have only been able to sketch in this presentation. So I look forward to the discussion to follow. But I leave you with one further thought. The UK system of welfare benefits has traditionally increased the amount of benefit payable as the number of children in the household has increased. But it now limits a household to benefits for two children, unless they were not voluntarily conceived. The idea is that people who do not claim benefits have to decide whether they can afford to have more children. So those who do claim benefits should be restricted to the average family size. Is this the beginning of an attempt to regulate human reproduction for everyone, irrespective of whether they need the help of assisted reproduction services? Or is it just a sensible cost-saving measure? I leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Lady Hale. Um, I hope you heard the applause here in the room and there, I'm sure there was also virtual applause online. Um, I mean, you, you really kind of put a lot of interesting and pressing actually questions on the table. Um, I think you took us to the heart of um, some of the political problems um, that need to be discussed in the UK and elsewhere. Um, not only, but especially also with your um, last remark. Um, and I noticed, I don't know whether you like podcasts, but it is, there is, so, I think there's a reason why it, it comes to be more and more popular because there is a certain kind of focus in just listening without viewing. So I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot um, um, following you through this tour de force, um, also kind of taking us back in the history of gender and sexuality, uh, about sexist hierarchies and heteronormative exclusions. Um, a lot of queer feminist issues that you touched on there as well, and kind of showing us that we've gotten quite some way since the times of Henry VIII, um, but there is still ongoing problems and there is new problems that come with the new technologies of um, reproduction that um, we can now use. And that is, of course, also um, questions and issues that people at the European University Institute engage with. And hence, it's now my pleasure to invite two PhD researchers to react, respond, come up with questions um, for uh, Lady Hale. And the first one to do so is Sylvie Tyler Taylor Armstrong, um, who is a PhD researcher in the law department. And I would now invite Sylvie to join the screen. Um, thank you very much. Welcome. Good to see you. Um, thank you, Andy. And please do, do take the floor. We're looking to your comments and questions. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I would firstly just like to echo everybody else's thanks. That was such a thought-provoking talk and it's really difficult to know where to start with the questions. Um, so I think I'm gonna start with the surrogacy question. And in particular, the point that you raised about who is it that these laws and these restrictions are designed to protect? Um, and I raise that because I think in the early days in particular, there was real concerns about the child and the risk that surrogacy amounted to a form of baby selling. But I think as you know, the decades have gone on and what we're seeing now is that one of the catalysts um, for discussions about regulating surrogacy and moving away from the prohibitive, prohibitive approach um, is the fact that actually the fundamental rights of the children born through surrogacy are often disadvantaged if the intended parents come from prohibitive states. Um, you know, you mentioned that people have a tendency to find their way around regulation. And I think we've seen that with surrogacy perhaps more than any other form of assisted reproduction where people have traveled from the prohibitive states of Europe um, abroad in order to enter into a legal surrogacy arrangement elsewhere but then struggled to return with their child or have their legal relationship to the child recognized afterwards. Um, and that's one of the reasons that more and more legal academics are starting to talk about the need to regulate surrogacy and move away from restrictions, whether those be absolute or in the case of the UK through the limitations on accessing a parental order. So having said all of that, um, I read your Whittington judgment with great interest and I know you mentioned there you relied a lot on changes in social opinion, but I wonder whether you think the law can always afford to wait for changes in social opinion when 
we've seen the fundamental rights of the children be disadvantaged so frequently, or whether you think this is an area where perhaps um, the law has a role in shaping social opinion, perhaps after the fact, um, given these violations. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think the law does have a role uh, in um, shaping uh, social opinion. It's usually a chicken and egg thing though. Uh, there's a little bit of law and then there's a little bit of public opinion and then, then there's a little bit of law, then there's a little bit of public opinion. The thing goes round uh, a bit like that. Um, and I think what has driven the change in approach in the, in the UK is just that recognition that it's not going to do the children any good if you refuse a parental order to a couple who've gone to California or even India uh, and uh, commissioned a, a surrogate uh, baby, if you deny the um, relationship which the commissioning parents have with that child. And so I don't think anybody knows of a case where a parental order has been refused not even when it's been applied for uh, long after the six months that it's supposed to be um, uh, applied for within. Uh, so I, I think concern for the welfare of the children and the facts of fait accompli has, has driven the law's approach, or at least the court's approach to this, which again has uh, led to changes in general opinion. Uh, but I think the other change has been um, the 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 increased use by same-sex couples, especially same-sex male couples, uh, who are quite a powerful voice. Uh, Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Um, and obviously wait with interest for the Law Commission's report, report on that um, and recommendations. Um, I'm conscious, I don't wanna take up too much time because I'm sure lots of people have questions, but I would really love to pick up on your final point that you made as well about welfare and the role that social welfare might have um, in regulating reproduction. And I guess I mentioned that primarily because I, I have some qualms about using social welfare as a means of attempting to regulate people's reproductive autonomy. Um, and I think my reasons for that are really twofold. One is I query whether it does um, affect everyone. And, you know, you mentioned, is this the start of us starting to regulate everybody's reproduction? But I would suggest it perhaps doesn't affect those who are more privately affluent and, and have the ability to have as many children as they want um, without relying on state welfare. And I guess my other concern is perhaps a more empirical one, um, which is whether there's room for some skepticism or doubt as to whether people's reproductive choices are always influenced by economic rationality and whether the benefit system has quite the role in people's decisions to have a child that perhaps governments think it is, I uh, think it does rather. And of course, if not, we then end up in a scenario where someone has more children than perhaps they can afford, doesn't have state welfare, and that again disadvantages the children and probably also has a gendered aspect in the sense that we know it's more often than not the mother who will end up staying at home and caring for the child um, if they can't afford to outsource you know, any childcare or help. Um, so with that in mind, I guess my question is, do you think it's a good idea to use social welfare to regulate um, reproductive decisions? And also, is there another way that we might think about taking a more universal approach to regulating reproduction if we think that it's necessary to do so? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the government would, I think, insist that it wasn't intending to regulate um, human reproduction by introducing the two-child rule. And uh, there's another rule which has had a profound effect upon children, which is the so-called benefit cap, which limits the amount of benefit which a household can claim, even if it limits it to less than the government uh, set subsistence level. So those are two um, measures which obviously have had an impact upon, upon children. And the government would not say they were doing it to try and encourage people to have fewer children. They would say that they were doing it to try and produce equity between families that were in work and resourcing themselves and families that had to claim benefit. 
uh, because they would say people who are resourcing themselves have to decide whether they can afford another child. I entirely agree with you that most of these choices are not made for wholly rational reasons, <laughs> and certainly not for mainly economic reasons. So even if the government were trying to do that, I suspect it would be pretty ineffective, but they'd say they weren't. But on the other hand, it has that effect. And uh, I myself, because of course I uh, am committed to the interests of children and particularly to the interests of children going up in disadvantaged households because they have many other disadvantages as well as poverty. So measures which deliberately increase the poverty of um, households containing children uh, do not seem to me to be um, justifiable. But that's, of course, my personal view. <laughs> Plenty of other people take a completely different view about it. Uh, so I don't think it, I don't think it's going to lead to similar um, attempts um, for for wealthier couples. I'm not quite sure what they could do. Well, they could, of course, introduce um, more uh, punitive tax rates, depending on how many children you have. Whereas traditionally, of course, it was the reverse. <laughs> You've got tax relief for having children. Whereas they could they could actually say, well, the more children you have, the more tax you're going to pay. I don't think they'll do that. Of course. Um, thank you so much again for both your speech and your, your answers to my questions. It's been really insightful and a huge amount of food for thought, I think, for everyone. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvie, from my side as well. Um, I, I have to admit that that new two-child policy is rather news to me, so I'm absolutely fascinated by this discussion. Um, but now I want to um, move on to the next respondent before I briefly wanted to remind our um, online participants that you um, are very welcome to share questions online as well through the um, Q&A function on your screens. Um, and you have time to do so while um, I'll invite Daphne Budas, a PhD researcher from the history department. Hi, Daphne. Hi. Um, who is now also going to share her questions and comments for Lady Hale. The floor is yours. Thank you, Benno. Um, first, I want to thank you very much, Lady Hale, for this brilliant talk. It was really interesting, and I find it truly fascinating to consider the extent to which the regulation of human reproduction has been a critical social concern since the 19th century and that the legal issue that resulted from it go, uh, go beyond the control of women's body, it includes also question of marriage law, parenthood, adoption rights, and since more recently, surrogacy. Um, and one thing I found particularly striking in your presentation is the fact that uh, you said that moral codes and practices keep changing over time, which requires the law to be adjusted. Um, and so it appears to me that the regulation of reproduction is rooted in moral and ethical consideration about family arrangements. So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a historian, uh, and I'm specialized in the history of gender and sexuality in British colonial context. And what you said in your talk made me thought about my own research and my own work. Because in my research, I came across the question of the regulation of marriage in, in British East Africa in the early 20th century. And at that time, British administrators tried to codify, literally codify local custom into a legal system that they call native laws. And they struggled to regulate indigenous marriages because they refused to consider certain indigenous unions as marriage, because for them, a marriage was a monogamous union, which should ideally take the form of a free and romantic partnership. And in that sense, for example, indigenous polygamy was seen as morally deviant. So indigenous social organization challenge British conception of family and the colonist sense of moral superiority prevents them to recognize the legal validity of these unions. So the reason why I'm talking about colonial history is because I think it forces me to question the notion of family and its legal definition. So similar to the British colonists in East Africa, um, I think that we are still very much attached to the model of the nuclear family. And also we think about parenthood as being shared by two persons, including uh, same-sex same couples, but still like two persons. 
However, this model doesn't necessarily correspond to the reality we're living in. If we think about step families, for example, with children from different marriage, it's, it's very common today. And also stem sex parent families and surrogacy are gaining more and more acceptance. So my question is the following. Do you think um, that the challenges posed by the regulation of reproduction today could be the opportunity to reconsider the, the Western notion of family, marriage, and parenthood. And I'm thinking especially of monogamy, for example, and the nuclear family. And I wonder, I wonder if the existence of children born in an uh, unusual way uh, should open the possibility to, for new models of family. I'm thinking of the possibility of having a, a third or even more parents or guardian for a child, for example. Um, then I also have a, a second question, and it's about the legacy of, of eugenics in contemporary debates. And you said that um, blue-eyed Danish sperm is very popular. And for me, it obviously it poses the question of, I mean, the importance attributed to eugenics today, and by extension, it also touches on the question of race. So blue-eyed Danish sperm not simply reveal that certain physical features are more valued than other, but in my view, it also echoes the notion of racial hierarchy and to a certain extent, the colonial fear of racial mixing. So I was wondering to which extent racial discrimination should be considered in this tricky question of the selection of sperm donors, for example, and in its legal regulation. Or to put it differently, how to legally prevent the risk of racial eugenics nowadays? <clears throat> Those are two enormous questions, aren't they? <laughs> I, I think I could have set myself either of those uh, and, and written a similar length paper in an attempt to answer them. Um, as to the first one, we are very used these days to a family situation in which children have more than two parents. Uh, there is so much partnering and repartnering that step families are extremely common. Uh, and if I think of my uh, own grandchildren who are the product of a same-sex um, civil partnership, uh, but the civil partners have split up and my daughter now has a different partner, I think they have basically three parents, three mothers, in fact. Not legally, but in terms of social uh, relationships and the people who care about them, look after them, um, and generally uh, are parent figures for them. And there are many, many families like that. So that aspect of the matter is, has changed dramatically uh, over the last, I think, four decades in, in the UK. Um, that, of course, has not led to UK law uh, recognising polygamous marriage in a way. Um, I mean, there are various ways in which it is, it is recognised because... Um, uh, it, it, it can give rise to uh, financial remedies if the marriage breaks up. So it's protecting. You know, in the olden days, they thought not to recognize polygamous marriages was to protect wives from being subject to polygamy. But of course, the impact was that um, people who practiced polygamy still practiced it. It just meant that not recognizing it disadvantaged the, the women uh, involved. Well, we got over that some time ago, 50 years ago, in fact, something like that. So yes, we recognize for certain purposes, but not for other purposes. Um, so I, I think that's both of those are just aspects of the way in which our legal system has become more protective of the interests of the less advantaged people in the family. And that includes usually, though not invariably, the women and, of course, the children. Um, so, yes, things are developing. As far as the legacy of eugenics is concerned, that 
is an enormous question. Um, I mean, I mentioned the, the question of the popularity of blue-eyed sperm from Denmark, uh, because it is, it is the reality. Um, there are some very well-known sperm banks in Denmark, which do a very good business. Um, I think it's partly because there is a shortage of sperm in the UK. And the reason for that is that not only is there a greater risk of the sperm donor being identified because of the change in the law that was meant for the benefit of the children, but it may put off some of the would-be donors, uh, but also because uh, sperm donation now has to be altruistic, whereas before sperm donors got paid not a lot, but something that was a useful supplement to a student's income. I mean, there were usually medical students or, um, who, who uh, donated sperm. So there is a great shortage. And that is one of the reasons for resorting to foreign sperm banks, rather, I think, than, um, than eugenic um, uh, considerations. I think sometimes when people are, because uh, this is very much a private enterprise thing, this is very much um, the people who want sperm, you know, going and getting it from wherever they want it. And um, it, it, it's a commodity. Uh, it's a market. Um, and uh, so the choice of the customer is, is going to dictate what they do. It's not going to be an officially imposed you know, eugenics in the way that, uh, you know, there was obviously talk of this in the 20s and 30s, uh, dreadful days. It's not, it's not that. But sometimes people do look for sperm which reproduces some of the characteristics of the, uh, the person who's going to be the social father um, or indeed the social other mother. Um, so things like height and eye colour and maybe skin colour as well. Um, but there's, there's a pretty fair old shortage of donations from uh, people of color in the UK. It's, uh, in fact, that's, that's, a, that's more of a problem, <laughs> that there isn't enough, uh, rather, than, uh, rather than that people are going elsewhere. So rest, very interesting questions, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, from my side, thanks to Daphne, thanks Lady Hale for, um, responding to those, um, I think also really important questions. So now if we may, Lady Hale, um, um, we would take questions from the audience, if that is okay. Yes, that, that, that's fine. I don't promise to know the answers. So if I don't know the answer or I can't answer it, I will say so. <laughs> that's fair enough. Um, so is there, is there any questions here in the audience? Um, we do have a Robin microphone. There is a, a question in the back. And if you could just briefly say who you are, for example. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, thank you very much, uh, Baroness Hell. My name is Niall Cochran. Uh, I work here on eugenics. Uh, so unsurprisingly, my question follows on from Daphne's, uh, which is to question perhaps this liberal model that um, I understand we've been being put forward whereby we might have limits on how artificial and other forms of reproduction can occur, but ultimately people are going to be able to go abroad and circumvent those limits, and the rights of the child will always plead in favour once they come back of uh, accepting that. I wonder how far that might go when the moral prohibition we're talking about is not simply about surrogacy, but something uh, a bit deeper, and genome editing is the one that immediately comes to mind, that one can imagine in the coming decades we would decide in the UK uh, not to allow certain forms of uh, enhancement, uh, certain forms uh, of choice of characteristics, such as those that Daphne touched on. And I wonder um, whether we'd accept uh, still a liberal model whereby that could simply be circumvented going to more liberal countries when the stakes were higher. I wonder if that is the case, whether the solution is more restrictive uh, regulation within the UK, or actually the need for more international regulation agreement uh, on mm. such subjects. Thank you. Well, that's an extremely interesting question. I think that the answer 
ought to be international uh, agreement and regulation. Because if we're talking about things that take place transnationally, international cooperation is usually the best way in which to solve whatever the perceived problem is. Um, but in this particular area of the law, of course, it is extremely difficult to get international cooperation, uh, as I'm sure you know, because the, 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 the range of views <laughs> is, is so enormous, um, you know, from the countries that have a free for all of surrogacy uh, to the countries that ban it altogether. And it's really tricky. And the same is true uh, of um, designer babies, which is what you're talking about. Um, I, I, I've read advertisements in the, from the United States, which basically suggest that you can design your own baby. You know, there are all sorts of characteristics that you can try and select for. Um, sex selection obviously was the most controversial when I was a member of the uh, Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. So uh, there clearly are a whole range of things that one could do, which most of us might think were morally very questionable uh, and that it was much better to let whatever course you have taken take its course and delight in the child that is then produced. Um, I think that that would be the, the liberal, the liberal look, uh, look, take on this. Uh, but if we do want to regulate it, I'm sure that international regulation is better than uh, tightening up in one country, mm. uh, but not in others. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks a lot um, for this. Um, and um, now I um, want to share a question that came in online from Caroline Lerch. Um, who also was wondering about morality, reproduction, and the legal system, whether it has the aim to influence the morals of society, or whether kind of things also work um, the other way around and the legal system follows society's morals. So if you want to say um, more about that, but then there is two other aspects of the question. Um, um, one is about the timing of British um, discussions about abortion. So Caroline wonders, I was wondering why the abortion issue was already settled comparatively early in the UK compared to other countries like the US, Poland or Germany. So that is, is one um, question you might want to um, address. And then I think maybe a follow up, which role does religion and the church play? in these kinds of debates about reproduction in the UK. So you mentioned the Bishop of London mm -hmm. um, back in 1934. Um, so mm -hmm. maybe you also want to say a bit more about your, what do you think about the role, role of religion in these discussions? Mm. Well, um, as you no doubt know, although uh, we have an established church in the United Kingdom, uh, the United Kingdom is probably, certainly England, is probably the least religious um, country in um, maybe certainly Western Europe. Um, uh, church uh, uh, adherence, belief, um, observance is, is really pretty low. Uh, it, it's actually higher amongst the non-Christian faiths in many ways. Yeah. But uh, the role of religion in um, influencing the development of the law has diminished very dramatically in the, in the UK. Um, that doesn't mean to say that the bishops don't still get to their feet and talk about it, because we've got um, 26 bishops who are automatically members of the House of Lords, uh, but they don't always say the same thing because there isn't a party line in the Church of England, so that's always very satisfactory. Um, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that religion has had much effect on, um, on our regulatory system. It does, of course, have a huge effect on individual people's decisions and attitudes. Um, if you think about the abortion thing, well, Roe and Wade was in 1963, wasn't it, in the United States? I think it was 1963. We have here an opinion of 73, but... Ah, oh, is, was it 73? I couldn't remember whether it was 63 or 73. If it was 73, well, then we got in first. 
Uh, and <laughs> of course, what we got in with was a medicalized model, not a freedom of choice privacy rights model. So uh, a different approach to it. So um, what the Abortion Act says is that if the risk to the woman of continuing to bear the child is greater than the risk of an abortion, well, then an abortion will be lawful. Well, that sounds brilliant, doesn't it? Um, it sounds as if it's health related and it is indeed health related, but you could almost always say that early in a pregnancy. So it, it is in fact a very liberal but medicalized uh, rule compared with, with Roe and Wade. Um, so maybe we did. Uh, what about the legal system following morals or the other way around? Well, I, as I say, I think it's a chicken and egg situation. Um, you, get, you get a change in, in social attitudes, moral attitudes, the law catches up with that and then sometimes goes slightly ahead of it. And then the um, social attitudes uh, catch up with the law and go slightly ahead of it and so on and so forth. That's, that seems to me, from having looked at these things over many years, uh, the way in which uh, the relationship develops. And then sometimes you get a backlash. <laughs> Once in a while. Thank, thanks a lot for that, which might also explain talking about the history of um, the regulation of abortion in the UK, why Northern mm. Ireland has a slightly different uh, trajectory there as well, right? Um, oh, 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 well, of course, I should have said, when talking about religion, I should have said uh, that uh, Northern Ireland is, of course, a a place where there is um, a much higher rate of religious observance than there is in Great Britain. Um, and so religion plays a much larger part uh, in thinking uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, not only Roman Catholicism, um, but also the particular brand of Protestantism that they have uh, uh, in Northern Ireland um, tends to lead to uh, similar, similar consequences. Th thanks a lot. And uh, the discussion about abortion, also there's a, a comment that um, somebody has shared anonymously online. Good evening, Baroness Hale, they say. Thank you for the talk. My question is rather broad, um, but I wanted to have a little insight on the theme of abortion. How is it possible that in certain states, women are not even allowed to consider deciding themselves for themselves for issues that regard only their bodies? The power and authority of a government directly weighs on the welfare of millions of women, and therefore many families, many children, many, or I'd say too many contexts, only based on a subjective ethical issue of the rulers that should consider and defend the welfare of the weak. That means women victims of sexual violence and or children that will have and bring suffering upon themselves and others if there are not conditions for a happy existence that potentially, as I mentioned, leads to a large number of concrete cases of suffering. So I don't know whether you want to react to that, but I definitely wanted to share this statement. I don't think I need to react to it, do I? So we leave that there. Um, and um, one, one more question that came in online um, from Sophie Hirschler. Baroness Hale, thank you a lot for the wonderful insights and questions. I have a rather general one. You mentioned how historically marriage laws were geared towards fostering specific gender roles. In what ways, in your opinion, does the regulation of reproduction still promote such traditional roles today? Or has it stopped doing so? My question is inspired also by the close connection of the term reproduction with care work as a social reproduction of life, as put forward, for example, by the wages for or against housework movement. So kind of here we come back to the um, larger feminist question um, about how the regulation of human reproduction strengthens, challenges, um, sexist hierarchies and specific perceptions around gender roles. Well, um, there are people who very, very, very much want to have children and cannot have children and therefore in the usual way and therefore need the help of assisted reproduction of various sorts. And they have been given um, that service in recent decades, which was not available to them before. If by 
letting a woman have a child, which she desperately wants, uh, and which the wonders of modern science enable her to do, is reinforcing gender roles. I, it is in a way, it, it's enabling a woman to fulfill herself as a mother. Um, and of course, I wouldn't think that motherhood was the only way in which a woman could fulfill herself, but if that's what she desperately wants to do, uh, and science can help her, well then, who are we to stand in her way? Um, and uh, she probably will still have a choice about how she brings up the child and how she runs her life thereafter because things have changed so much. But the great advance for women uh, was with the availability of contraception and I think to a lesser extent abortion because I would always regard contraception as being um, a morally and physically um, a preferable uh, approach uh, than to, to abortion. Uh, but control of her own fertility is the thing that has made gender roles so much less uh, inevitable uh, uh, in, in recent years. I mean, they, they were always avoidable if you wanted to but and had the resources to, but it was not easy. And now it is easy. Uh, and that, I think, is the, is the greatest. I would say it was an advance. <laughs> for the reason, for the reason given by the um, gentleman who um, produced that uh, statement um, just before, which we all listen to, I think, with very considerable sympathy. Um, Sarah, you also wanted to ask a question. Can we have the microphone? Is it on? Yeah, seems so. Baroness Hill, sorry to uh, take the floor again, but. I also would like to ask you a question, which I think in your role as president of the Supreme Court, you would never have been able to answer because the case might come before you, but now you are no longer, I would be very keen to know your views on this. And it's about a case that was decided uh, in a, the High Court in the UK in September. And it touches upon this issue of designer babies that you um, mm -hmm. mentioned. And it's a, a woman with Down syndrome who argues that the 1967 Abortion Act in the UK is discriminatory because one can terminate a, a abortion much later if one is, expects that a child mm -hmm. is seriously handicapped. And um, in fact, that at least the lawyers argued, most of these serious handicaps is considered uh, Down syndrome. And of course, what this case brings up is that it's not just about regulating about who can reproduce, but actually it goes to the very question, what does it mean to be human? And, and how does uh, this, this stigma on Down syndrome uh, then affect people who are born with Down syndrome for the rest of their lives? And I wondered what legal approach you would take, which, which human rights you would consider if this case had, become, had come before you in your role as a president of the Supreme Court? Well, of course, uh, anybody is going to say, I don't have a definitive answer to that because it hasn't come before me in the Supreme Court. And so I haven't heard all the learned argument which we would have were it so to do. I think the closest I can get to it is the case that we had, which came from Northern Ireland, where the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission challenged the near impossibility of getting an abortion in Northern Ireland. In th three respects, they challenged it, uh, the unavailability for cases of rape, for cases of incest, for cases of fatal fetal abnormality, and for cases of serious fetal abnormality. And the majority of the court held that it was uh, a violation of the woman's human rights to deny abortion in cases of rape, incest, and fatal fetal abnormality, but not in the case of serious fetal abnormality, for the very reasons that you have mentioned. So that's the closest I can get to it. If we're looking at it in a human rights analysis, that's, that's how I would answer it. 
Okay, thank, thanks a lot. Kind of we're, I, I can see that we're kind of getting to kind of the, you know, um, um, the really important issues and, and, and questions here in the discussion. Um, I, one more question that came in online, I would like to share um, as, as the last one, because I think it's also a good one to conclude the discussion um, from my dear colleague, Lauren Cassell from the history department as well, who is a historian of reproduction and in a big multi-author survey of the field from antiquity to the present day, my co-editor, she writes, and I identified a number of before and after stories told by historians and others about how things in the past were better or worse than they are now. I won't rehearse those narratives here, but I'd like to ask you whether you think we are living in an era when things are better than they were 50 or 100 years ago in terms of reproduction in the UK in particular, and in the wider world. So one, one um, um, big question um, to conclude this discussion. Well, uh, I would say I think that they are better, in the UK at least, indubitably better. Uh, the first reason, which of course is, because we were talking about regulation, I didn't really mention, but, the developments in maternal care and the safety of childbirth are of course the most important thing uh, for, for women. Uh, and uh, well, actually 50 years ago, it was all right. Uh, but I think if I had become pregnant 70 years ago, certainly a hundred years ago, I would probably have died in childbirth. And that's going to be true of a large number of women. So the improvements in uh, the care of the, the mother during pregnancy and during childbirth uh, are, are incredibly important, undoubtedly much better. There's still a way to go. We, we have um, discrepancies, particularly you know, on ethnic grounds, which are extremely worrying. Um, it looks as if our maternity care for uh, people from ethnic minorities is not as good uh, and uh, is in need of improvement. So we can never be complacent, but there has been improvement. And of course, the other aspect of improvement we've been talking about a lot, and that's the question of choice. You can choose whether or not to become pregnant. Uh, and uh, that, I would have said, is an improvement. Both of those things. Thank you very much. And that, I think, is a, a really great concluding word. Um, thanks a lot to Sylvie and to Daphne as well and to the people who shared the question here and online. And thanks, of course, most of all, um, to Lady Hale for a fantastic talk and discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you.